Hello, everybody. Welcome in to the NBA Front Office Show. I'm Trevor Lane. You can find me on Twitter at Trevor underscore Lane. Joined by Keith Smith at Keith Smith NBA. Um, Keith, I talked to you a little bit before we came on here. I am living that kids or kid is home for the summer life um, while trying to get ready for what is going to be a very eventful draft night coming up on the 22nd. Oh boy, school is out for summer and here in the Lane household we are we are feeling it. Don't get me wrong. Love my daughter. She is fantastic. But boy, does she she wants to play all day every day and that makes it a little difficult to do things like uh, you know, work. Yeah, I, I hear you. Thankfully for us like we're farther far enough ahead of you on that curve that uh we're now to the world where call me for dinner and i don't want anything to do with you otherwise for the most part so <laughs> it's uh you know we're kind of into the uh you know uh hey it's noon you're gonna get out of bed you know kind of kind of point in the world and and you know so so i'm trying to fill up my mornings with productivity and then uh and then then we move about the day from there but yeah i do i remember those days those yep. those summer days of you know hey let's do this let's do that and that's when uh summer camps and all those other things become yes. very very handy tools uh to make work <laughs> as the summer goes along we've got some of those planned um and uh, we've got swim lessons and all that all that sort of stuff uh, all planned out, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's going to be a fun time balancing all of this. I've already played more games of candy land than I care to, to admit, oh, man. but, but nonetheless, we do have plenty of NBA news to get, get to because somehow in the middle of the endless stream of board games and things of that nature, we do have to talk a little bit of basketball here. Um, let's start with this. The report saying that the Rockets who have all the cap space, are interested in Fred Van Vliet, Brooke Lopez, Cam Johnson, Dylan Brooks. My first thought, Keith, when it comes to the Rockets, is how much of this is the Rockets are legitimately interested in everyone versus the Rockets are the boogeyman for agents to use as, hey, this team, oh, the Rockets have a ton of cap space? Yeah, they're definitely interested in my client. We see this, I feel like, every year with the team that's got the most cap space, they get connected to like a million players. And I wonder how much of it is agents wanting that out there. So the incumbent team feels pressured to up their offer. Yeah. I think there's definitely some of that. It's, you know, and it's, it's different than trying to use like the Spurs because the Spurs don't really allow themselves to be used in that, that, that way right like they, they mm-hmm. tend to be a lot more of a uh you know hey it's gonna be you know you're not going to be able to you know convince people that we're just out here offering everybody but the rockets by all reports are really pushing forward this year it sounds like they, they want to be good and we know there's the james harden stuff we we know there's some other stuff so i think we're in a point with them where it becomes uh all right let's go Right, let's let's uh, you know, kind of move move this forward a little bit with, with this team. So, speaking of the James Harden stuff, uh, there was a report out there, Shams Tarania, who was on the Rosillo show, uh, saying that uh, James Harden is torn between Philly and Houston, and that's, I mean, it felt like everything was moving towards him going to Houston. Maybe this is just you know trying to show Philly that it wasn't predetermined, that it was, you know, a, a real process that he had to think through and all of that. Or it could be he actually is torn here. But what he decides will go a long way towards determining what the offseasons look like for both of these clubs. And they're going to need to know as soon as possible so they can make decisions on guys like, like if you're if you if the Rockets don't wind up getting James Harden, maybe Fred Van Vliet is a fallback option. You know, and like what you can offer these other guys changes drastically. And so that's going to be something to keep an eye on here. What does James Harden do? That's the domino that has to fall before we know what Houston is really up to. Yeah, absolutely. And as we've said in the past, when we've talked about this story, you have, you know, if you go the James Harden route, then it becomes far more reasonable to say, all right, you know, we, whether they're at 60 or 70 million in cap space, either way, right. It's going to be Harden's going to get roughly 47 million of that. Then the rest of that, you can say, Hey, Brooke Lopez, right, as one of the guys mentioned. Hey, mm-hmm. Dylan Brooks, maybe both of them, right? You come in. Then we're going to trade, you know, two kid, two of the kids together to go get another veteran or something like that. Cause you're certainly not going to just add these guys to that super young roster and move it forward that way. You're definitely going to move on from some of those kids. Cause the idea, if you're getting James Harden, is we're trying to win in the next two, three years. 
window mm-hmm. if you had a guy like Brooke Lopez and those kind of things. So so that'll help them know which way to go. I, I don't think I don't think right because of the way tampering is now and all those kind of things that come along with that. I don't know that we're going to know by the time the Rockets make their draft pick. Well, what they're doing, I think they're, they're probably making that pick for for themselves for the most mm-hmm. part. Um, but what we could know is if that player doesn't sign almost right away to be ready to go. Then is it, all right, they're going to put that player in a trade and move that guy on, <clears throat> you know, in, in a deal as they, they try to build out a roster around James Harden. That could be the direction we see there. And the reason for that is because once that rookie player signs that contract, once they're, if they're not under contract yet, you can go ahead and trade them. So you could yep. draft player X and then immediately trade them. You could trade them a week later, whatever. They're not on a contract. Once they sign that contract, is it 30 or 60? It's 30, 30. days, right? 30, 30 days yep. um, before they can be traded. So if the Rockets, say, want to make a trade and they want to go get somebody, let's say they want to trade, um, they want to trade whatever. They're going to put together a few young players and they're going to go get a veteran. Let's say, I don't know, let's say they're going to target let's throw Buddy Heald out there. They're going to go yep. after Buddy yep. Heald, right? Why not? Just pick a random player. Um, they're going to trade for that player. If the player they drafted is part of that package to go get said veteran player, they are going to have, they'd have to wait the 30 days if they yep. signed them to, to go get them. So that's, that's the why Andrew that's, Wiggins that's something that's important. Thing, yes. right? When Kevin Love went to the Cavs, Wiggins had already signed. So they had to wait 30 days. So we all kind of sat around and, you know, nobody could talk about Kevin Love joining the Cavaliers as the kind of third guy in their new big three. But, you know, we all, we all had to just wait, wait, wait. And then all of a sudden, 30 days later, it was, hey, Kevin Love's going to the Cavs. And, you know, mm-hmm. off we all went with that. So that's that's just kind of how the process works with, with those ones. You know, the other thing to consider in, in all of this is whether or not James Harden goes to Houston will also determine, to some degree, how interested in joining the Rockets some of these players are. Yeah, yeah. Um, like I can't see, I mean, maybe if the money is just so much more than what anyone else is offering, but I can't see a 35 year old Brooke Lopez joining the Rockets if James Harden yeah. doesn't doesn't show up. So that'll yeah. be something to, to look at too. Absolutely. Even like Dylan Brooks, like that probably doesn't make as much sense, right? Yeah. To, you know, kind of, kind of come in and be kind of what the veteran in the room. And they're not, it's not like they're like the Orlando magic are going to be kind of my proxy for this all off season where the right veteran could push them into playoff contention. Like they were Mm -hmm. close enough a year ago. The Rockets are so far away. Like they're, they're, they're not, they, they're like two, three of the right veterans away from becoming a playoff contender versus just, you know, one guy, but you know, Houston's going to have a lot to say with the way this off season plays out, just whoever it is that's sitting on the most cap space, especially if there's a sense of they're starting to get a little impatient with the rebuild that they're going to always, you know, kind of just not, I don't want to say control free agency, but that is what it is to some extent. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, looking at a potential extension, should the Lakers give Anthony Davis an extension? He'll have, uh, he's got an early termination option in the off season of 2024. So that's next summer. There was a bit of back and forth. Uh, Dave McMenamin saying that the Lakers, uh, should not give him an extension, that that's not something they're going to look at. That instead they're going to let this next season play out and then see what's what in the summertime. Brian Windhorst saying the opposite, saying that this summer they need to Door's extend off. Anthony Davis. <laughs> yeah, this is right? that. What? How do you see this from from your perspective? What do you? What should the Lakers? I've already spent a decent amount of time talking about this today. What do you think the Lakers should do with with AD? Yeah, I think it's it's interesting, right? Because on the one hand, Anthony Davis will be thirty uh, in uh-huh. March, or I guess he is thirty. He's thirty. Yep. Um, so you know, so you're you're beyond. You know, not that age thirty is the barrier it once was, but you're you're still on the you know he's still got good years left in him, but you're on the backside, right? I, I don't, I, something tells me he's not going to have a LeBron like run of two decades of, you know, being a great player. Sure. So I think if you're the Lakers, you just got to be really careful uh, with this because what you don't want to do is say, all right, you know what, AD cool. You, you, Oh, you're going to decline the player option and we'll give you a five year max extension. That probably isn't a good idea, right? Because the last couple of years that potentially could be pretty ugly. Uh If it is, you know, even if he opts in or he opts out, 
but we're going to add one or two years to the to to the deal, even at max money. That's probably okay, right? That's going to take you into you know his his mid thirties, and then then you kind of reevaluate it from there. But you know anything. Once you get past a couple years, that's where I get a little squeamish just because you don't even know where, where you're going to be as a franchise at that point. And is Anthony Davis as a singular entity going to be enough to lift you to where you need to be and to draw in other talent? Right. That's the questions you have to ask if you're the Lakers. If you extend him is you have to believe, yes, we can pull in other talent to come in, surround Anthony Davis. And we're going to turn this into, you know, a four or five year contention window if we extend him you know, much beyond another year or two. Because of all those kind of who knows type questions or, or answers to those questions, I should say, I think you probably do let it play out. Yeah, let it play out one more year. You can still offer more than anybody else can, you know, in free agency, just because you you have the ability to do that. Uh, so, you know, even if he does opt out after next season, you kind of play it out and see where you're at. And in the other good option too is because it's a player option on that last year, if he declines that, they can still then go in and do an extension even before we hit free agency mm-hmm. if he were to decline it because it's anybody on a, what would then be an expiring contract, you're able to do that. And maybe, you know, they make enough offseason moves where you feel like, all right, we're set for the next couple of years. You you can you know start to build it out that way. I think the big trigger point in a lot of ways for the Lakers, as crazy as this is considering where this guy's career come it's going to be what happens with austin reeves right because if you're sitting there with austin reeves and you're you're forced into matching an offer sheet that goes something like you know 12 million 13 million 30 million you know just that's the way the jump would work all of a sudden you're you have to start thinking about how you're going to build out your roster just a little bit sure. differently uh because of that that presence so that's gonna gonna kind of trigger things a little bit too for the lakers of all right which way are we approaching these other guys on the roster See, I've been of the mindset that you give him the extension. Um, I think you made a good point about not going five years, yeah, but that you give him the extension because even if you decide, hey, we really want cap space in 2024, you can probably get that from it. Like some team would take Anthony Davis oh, into, yeah. into cap if you just were dead set on cap. So even if he suffered, even if he had a really injury plague season, somebody's probably taking Anthony because he's that good of a player. Yeah. Um, where you can move him and get cap space next summer. Or if you decide, you know what, it, LeBron walks away in 2024, we want to move into a post-LeBron, post-AD era, you can jumpstart that era by trading Anthony Davis and getting some type of assets in return for him rather than just pure cap space. But again, you do damage your own flexibility a little bit if you yeah. if you go that route. So that's And if it's, hey, five years or nothing, then again, maybe you do say, well, let's just wait. But I've been on the mindset that you want him under contract so that you could at least flip him and get something in return or even build the next iteration of the team around him and try to lure another star to come join up having already that first star in place. Um, that's been my approach, but that's interesting that you say you would, you would just kind of wait and, uh, and let it play out for this next year. Yeah. I mean, if he's willing to do, you know, let's add only two years on that sure. probably changes the math enough for me where I'm like, okay, you know, I can, I can do that because to your point, he still becomes, you know, or still is very tradable at that. Now you have to also kind of game it out a little bit too of, all right, well, where does Anthony Davis want to go? Right. And where, where can we send him? They're, they're going to give us a great package for him. Well, it's got to be a contender, right? Cause that's going to be who wants him. Cause it's going to be the idea is right. He lifts us that just gets a little bit harder for those 40 and $50 million players because some of those contenders, if they're dancing around the hard cap line or the the super tax line, they won't be able to put two, three players together in a trade and Mm -hmm. do those kind of things. So there's a lot more complicating factors with all those, these things that, just quite frankly, it didn't exist, um, you know, pre previous. So that's going to be something else you just have to at least have in the back of your mind. I, I think you're still right. I think you can still find a trade where, where you go, but just those, you know, let's throw a whole bunch of guys together. Cause the other news um, that's, I, I mean, I, it's funny. Everybody's kind of picking apart the term sheet now and, 
by pulling other little pieces sure. out. But I think Eric Pincus was the first one I saw a tweet about this. Um, we have, and then I had one myself. There's two new hard cap triggers that are coming in. One of the new hard cap triggers is the one that Eric tweeted about is if you do a trade where you take back more than 110% of what you send out. So to make it very easy, if you do a $10 million trade and you, you take back more than $11 million in that trade, you're hard capped at the first apron. So it's the sure, same yeah. thing as, yeah, it's the same thing as like, you know, using the non-taxpayer, or getting a player via sign and trade or getting, uh, using the biannual exception. The other one that I tweeted out was if you are a team that is, you're sitting above the tax apron, but you're, you're below the second apron. Sure. If you, so use let's your say you're at 100, 165 million. Yeah. Just to give it a number. You, and if you use your taxpayer MLE, the $5 million dollars, uh-huh. You get then get hard capped at the super tax, the second apron. You are it, it's right. like a second level of hard cap because why that one came into play is that closes a loophole of all right. Well, we're not super expensive right now. Let's use the the taxpayer uh, mid level, and then then we'll blow past the the second apron. You can no sure. longer, you can't do that either. So just you know more things you know to the teams are going to have to consider. It just gets that much more restrictive to be in those spots where it's you know you're you're so expensive. See that one that one I knew, but the whole bit about and you mentioned before like not putting multiple players in the trade is that definitely going through this next year in terms of aggregating players into not, a trade? It doesn't. I haven't not seen. For, yeah, not for this off season, but that uh, that's will what start I was next. Yeah, in in the next off season. They'd okay. be uh, being unable to aggregate players if you're above the super tax. Um, you can't you can't sign and trade a player away if you're above the super tax. Um, that's not a thing you'll be able to do because that kind of closes the idea of all right. Well, we're going to give player X you know thirty million dollars even if they're a you know five million dollar player because that allows us to bring back thirty million in trade. You mm-hmm. won't be able to do that either um, if you're above. So if you're if you're above that super tax, I keep saying it. You are really, truly down to signing your own draft picks, resigning your own guys, and uh, signing minimum contracts. So you, you don't have a lot of avenues left because even making trades is going to be pretty difficult unless you're working with a team that is sitting on cap space, either directly or as a third team in where you're kind of just dumping some salary off to them. It's just going to be really hard to bring back you know, any kind of real value in those trades. That's why you're going to see guys get – these kind of weird contracts in the next couple of years, because mm-hmm. it's going to be, Hey, even if we can't sign and trade them, you know, three months in six months in whatever it is from when we sign them, either December 15th, January 15th, depending on the raise they get, we'll then be able to trade them then at whatever their new number is. And it may, you may have teams that look at it and say, all right, he's a $15 million guy. But let's give them 20 or 22 because then that gives us a little bit of extra trade flexibility moving forward. Keith, you know, the more I hear about all this, the more I think, oh no, what have they done? The more I think they blew it. I, I think they really, I think they went way too far with a lot of this stuff. Yeah. Um, and maybe it'll be readdressed at some point. But here's here's my thing. Like, for one thing, hard cap, the two words hard cap to the players association, that that those are bad words, right? And they wanted nothing to do with a hard cap. Guess what? You got one. That's what yeah. this essentially is, right? That's that's how teams are going to treat that $179.5 million mark for that super tax level, that second tier. We're going to, they're going to look at that as a hard cap that they're not yep. going to want to go past, period. So and like, and I mean, for people, reasons, sorry to interrupt you. No, you're fine. It used to be for reasons of just the owners didn't want to spend that much, right? Yeah. That was why that kind of even the apron existed as a de facto hard cap for almost everybody in mm-hmm. the league just because it was like all right i'll go five million into the tax once we're talking you know seven eight more than that in the case of like the warriors clippers and those teams yeah. they they um everybody was kind of like yeah that's a little that, that's a bridge too far for me now with the the what we call the super tax that second apron that is more it's still a de facto hard cap because it's not truly a hard cap but it, it might as well be because what you've done to these teams is they're going to be like it's so not only is the owner going to be like dude you want me to pay how much in yep. salary plus tax penalties now on top of that it's going to be all right i'll do it 
but how prove to me you can then make a good enough roster to win and contend for the title and get to the finals. And a lot of front offices are not going to be able to make that kind of commitment of, yeah, we're certain we can mm-hmm. get there. You know, it's, it's going to have to be, yeah, you know, all right, let's try to do what we can to operate under that. And that's why, you know, it's funny every other time and it, it shouldn't say, it means like two other times, but like when they introduced the idea of the luxury tax and all these restrictions, that were coming in, they offered up an amnesty provision um, as a way to, Here's a quick way you can get your books in line. This year, they didn't give it. And that to me was, all right, these super duper rich teams, these you know, Warriors, Clippers that are paying a ton of money, not only are we going to make it really tough on you, we're also not giving you any easy outs. If you want out of this, you're going to have to feel some pain. You cannot just say, all right, see you later, Marcus Morris. That saved us $17 million, wiped off our cap. He still gets paid because Steve Ballmer doesn't really care. And that gives us all kinds of flexibility. Nope, they said, you don't even get that this time around. You want to trade them, you trade them, and you get nothing. You're going to have to figure it out how to get there, you know, pay a team to take his contract on or whatever it may be. It's going to be you know, really interesting to see, um, you know, how teams treat this as a two-year roster building window of this year I got to really work to try to get my books in line so next year I can do some stuff. Well, and they were given no time essentially to prepare for this. Yeah. Right? Like it just, yeah. hey, here it is. Now there's a couple of things, like you said, aggregating – uh, salaries in a deal like that's going to get filtered in not this this mm-hmm. summer but the next but but for the most of this the the punitive measures of this new uh second tier the super tax it's it's all happening right away so these teams if you're the clippers if you're the the, the warriors if you're any of these teams you're like there, there's nothing i can do about my books at this point aside from just giving away players this summer to try to get underneath this um which is going to be extremely messy and then uh, on top of that, again, the, the Players Association had hard cap as a, a dirty word. I remember it, it was first introduced as an upper spending limit? Yeah. And everybody just rolled their <laughs> eyes and went, yeah. nope, there's no chance they're going to go for that because yeah. it's a hard cap. But they did. They did. They went for yeah. hard cap. They're not calling it the upper spending limit. They're calling it a second tier yeah. uh, <laughs> tax apron. But it's yeah. still, it's going to be a hard cap. That's what it is. And here's the issue, Keith. This whole bit about well, if you take back more than what is 110% in a trade, yep. then you trigger a hard cap. Why are you doing anything to try to restrict trades like that if you're the yeah. NBA? Part of what the NBA has, part of the brilliance of the NBA right now compared to other leagues. Look, the NFL dominates. There's no question. But the NBA offseason destroys all other offseasons. Yeah, right? the NBA, cool. It yep. is incredible. And part of that is because of the player movement. Part of that is because of all the, diff- the different trade-off possibilities. Why would you do something so that is going to restrict trades? Teams are going to say, well, we can't do this trade because we don't want to trigger this hard cap. That doesn't make sense to me. That's just shooting yourself in the foot and taking away some of the luster of your offseason by limiting the number of trades and transactions that can take place, which has become the game within the game that so many people, particularly people who are watching the show, follow so Mm -hmm. vehemently so again i think the nba they overcorrected the more we hear about this the more i'm thinking oh no they have gone way too far they lost their minds with this new cba so just to put this in perspective a little bit right because for for i think a lot of people they get the warriors and clippers of it all right That, that part's very easy but there are by my projections in Hey, hey, I'm not going to pat myself on the back so much. I throw my own shoulder out here, but I'm pretty good at this. This is like, this is in my wheelhouse. This is what I do. We've got nine total teams. That's inclusive of the the Warriors and Clippers. So seven additional teams that are really going to be dancing around that super tax line this year, Atlanta, Boston, Denver, Miami, Milwaukee, New York, and Phoenix. Those teams are all within range that even spending the taxpayer mid-level for them, if they had it right now, Golden State and the Clippers, they, they, they're so far over They're not still, even close. They're not even close. doesn't matter. But those other teams using that would hard cap them and leave them with extremely little flexibility to fill out their roster. So a team like, let's use Milwaukee as an example. Milwaukee is right now, 
kind of starting the off season, they're about 6.8 million under the super tax line. But the challenge is they've got a lot of guys they need to resign, right? Chief among them, Chris Middleton, who I know we're going to talk about in yep. a minute here. So if you were to use the, the, the uh, quote unquote taxpayer, you wouldn't be able, you'd be extremely limited in what you could give Chris Middleton, right? That you're, you're just not even going to be able to get to the number that makes sense for him. Uh, for example, like, like Atlanta, they're only $4.6 million under that super tax line. So that's, you can't even use the 5 million, right? You can't even yep. get there. All those teams are dancing. You know, Philly, they, they're 16 million under, but if they resign James Harden, they're right there. Right now you're, you're way past it. So all of these teams are going to be very, very limited in using it. And what that's done is I know the whole idea is they beefed up the, the, the non-taxpayer mid-level. It's 12.2 million now. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit more. They beefed up the room exception. It went from about 5 million to 7.6. Essentially yep. the room exception and the taxpayer flip-flopped in value. Yep. It is a you know kind of the way to think about that. Uh, they also flip flopped and how long those deals can be too. Um, but but what you're really looking at with those kind of situations there is, you took that five million dollars off in hopes of other teams will spend more and have the ability to spend more. But what the challenge is is I don't know that taking five million in spending power away from the Warriors or the Clippers. May makes it any more likely that the Spurs spend their entire room exception of 7.6 million. I don't know that they're going to. Now, they did make it so that if you're so far under the cap, like San Antonio and Indiana were for most of this season, Indiana, or excuse me, Indiana, well, we'll use Indiana first. They did the renegotiation and extension with Turner. That ate up most of their cap space. That's how they 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 got above the salary floor. San Antonio didn't even get above the salary floor. So they're going to pay out a bonus to all the guys who are on their roster. Uh, that'll get negotiated and worked out. But the challenge is now moving forward, if you're that far under, you basically get a cap hold that goes to your books that brings you up to the floor. So you wouldn't be able to do those other things like renegotiate and extend a player or eat. 10 contracts in the course of a season mm -hmm. and wave all those guys. Those things aren't going to be able to happen. Now you can do it all the way through the off season. That's once the season starts, sure. that number flips and they drop that, that uh, cap hold in there for lack of a better term, but it really is. It's a major, major thing now where these teams are going to have to think about roster building in a very different way. It's going to be, I think more has to get done in the summer because Doing more in season is just going to be hard. It's going to be really, really difficult. Yeah. Pull that off. And again, not all of these things hit this summer, right? There, there's definitely stuff that's going to phase in, and we're going to have to see how how it kind of comes in and, and they figure stuff out. But when we when we're talking a year from now, we're going to spend an awful lot of time uh, kind of putting teams into buckets of here's all the things they have to spend versus not spend, and here's yep. all the things, you know, this is where what, what these teams are facing and working around. And it's, gonna, it's just going to look very, very different than it looks today. Hey, when we're building prospective trades, hey, look, this trade works. Oh, no, wait, this is over yep. 110%. They can't do it. Yep. Uh, I can just... tell you right now on SpotTrack, our version of our trade machine, we're rebuilding all the logic behind it because there's all these new rules that you know, mm. weren't, weren't in place. Or you know, are, I guess they are in place for about 24 more days. And then, and then a bunch of them will not be in place effective July 1st. So, yeah, well, a lot, of, you know, I mean, it's, I mean, to, like to your point, Teams are, to to some extent, are going to be learning this on the fly as they go. I know players got some stuff in this CBA negotiation when we look at um, their profit sharing and things and things of that nature. Um, but all uh, a lot of this, it's so owners can say, well, we're not going to spend this and not get the fan backlash of our owner is cheap because yep. now they can go, oh, no, 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 no. It's not – we can't spend this because – we really want to be able to use the taxpayer bid level. We don't want to have yeah. these trade restrictions, all this other stuff. So I'm sorry, guys. I just I can't spend yeah. because that will limit the way we can build out the roster. I would totally spend if I could, but shoot, these darn restrictions that I created, <laughs> that these that that's what's preventing me from from being able to spend. Man, yeah. the owners have crushed the CBA. They really there did. are um, two groups of people that become 
extremely valuable now moving forward uh, within team structures. Or I'm, I'm going to say, I'm going to actually say three. Um, two off-court folks are your salary cap management peep folks because they're mm-hmm. going to not only have to know your yo know, stuff inside and out, but the entire league. And that's always been that way, but it's going to sure. have to be really, have a really good handle on what's going on with all 30 teams. Your scouting group, so your pro personnel, your college, and your international scouting groups are going to have to be all over it because the ability to find diamonds in the rough that nobody else is on is going to be so important because everybody is going to have to an extent. It, it's not just the Warriors and Clippers of the world, right, who are super limited because these teams are going to say, I don't want to go above that, you know, uh, you know second tax apron, the super tax. That's you know, where I need to you know, cut it there it's going to be even more important that these teams are able to find these guys for, you know, the minimum yeah. signings that it comes in. And then on the court, your player development folks are going to have to be rock solid because you'll be fine you're, with you're your churning through players. Guys. That's it. You're going to be churning through the bottom of that roster. And as you bring in undrafted for the Austin Reeves of the world, sure. you're going to have to bring those guys in develop them, coach them up, get them into a spot where they can really play. And then say goodbye. That's going to be huge. Yeah. And then possibly. Yeah. And you, you may be right in that spot where maybe I mean, look at, can't do this. Look at Miami right now. Max, Max Struess, Gabe Vincent. Can they even keep these guys? Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be really hard. Yeah. And you find, so you're going to have to find them, develop them. Then when they're good enough to get paid, you're not going to be able to keep them. Yeah. Or, or you got to move on from somebody else. You probably really like. Right. Right. Like that's, that's the challenge. It's just going to be, if we think roster cycles are short now, which I know that's one of the big complaints, you know, sometimes people have Mm -hmm. is like, man, I can't get attached to these guys because they're all gone within three, four years. Yeah. It might be more like two or three years for a lot of players going forward. And you're going to have to move off. If you blow a signing and you're like, holy crap, this guy you know, did not work out the way we thought. You're going to have to be, be willing to move on right away and yeah. you know, get get out of that that signing there and you know just, just move in a different direction. So mm-hmm. it, it's going to be really fascinating to watch how you know just team building is impacted over the, the life of this CBA because it's not like anything we've ever seen before. Yeah, this is going to be a drastically different uh, version of NBA roster building. And, it, and it's something, of course, we'll be right here breaking it all down and hopefully, hopefully helping everybody get through it. Um, wow, man, that this was not a planned segment for us, but that 110% thing, that threw me for a loop. That, it <laughs> yeah. feels like we just keep adding on to the ownership wins sides of yeah. the column here uh, in this CBA. Uh, all right, let's 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 finish things up here. The Bucks uh, potentially keeping Chris Middleton with the evidence being that Chris Middleton was involved in the coaching decision-making process. Uh, Adrian Griffin obviously getting that head coach job. But you're probably not involving Chris Middleton in the decision making to pick your next head coach if you're not planning on bringing him back as a player, which could mean bye bye Brooke Lopez potentially. Yeah, it could be. I mean, we talked about that part of it when that news came out of like, yeah, if Chris Middleton's involved here, like that probably sends more of a sign that he wants to stay mm-hmm. uh, here in in uh, Milwaukee. So um, <laughs> you got that. Wants- He's like, uh, you will pet me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Um, so it's uh it's funny, but they um but the Brooke Lopez part of it, yeah, we'll see. If if not, they can still keep the two of them again, right? You're just mm-hmm. gonna be very, very expensive and keeping the two of them, but then you're gonna be in a spot where you may be, you know, all right, how do we you know build out the rest of the roster? That's yeah. gonna be where like Marjon uh, Bochamp from last year, who you drafted, he may need to be a rotation guy next year. You may not have the ability to fill out the roster in other ways. They signed Joe Ingles with their taxpayer mid-level a year ago. Mm -hmm. They're probably not going to have that to work with if they re-sign both Middleton and Lopez. So, you know, it's going to be really, really interesting. I'm already petting you, dude. (laughs) (laughs) He's like, he's pawing at me. He's like, just keep petting me. he's He's determined. He's the yeah, he's in charge. Um, he's the boss. What it is is we're recording later than usual, and it's basically dinner. It's time. dinner time. So that's he's like, I'm hungry. Yeah. All right. Well, let's let's wrap things up then, for the sake of the dog here. Uh, last <laughs> thing we've got Victor Wembanyama. Uh, there was a, a little bit of like, is he really going to debut at the California Classic? Something like, are they going to hold his debut for which is in Sacramento, which takes place a few days before the Las Vegas Summer League, or are they going to hold this? until to headline summer league and make that be his like official debut to NBA fans. 
uh, the NBA putting out there like, no, we're okay. If he debuts at the California Classic, that's still Summer League. That's fine. Um, I don't know. And I don't think it's going to matter, really. Like, great. If he debuts at the California Classic, great. That's going to increase the number of people who go to the California Classic. If he doesn't debut uh, or if he does debut there, I don't think that's going to change the size of the crowds in Las Vegas one bit. Yeah. Um, it's not going to matter. So, uh, yeah, why should the NBA have a problem if he makes his debut in Sacramento? Great. That's fantastic. Yeah, the NBA has generally in Las Vegas made it so that the number one and number two picks face off in the first night the first game. of full summer league. And, mm-hmm. and that's usually where where that happens. That's usually right in the, you know, the, the 8 p.m. window or whatever on the East Coast. Sure. Um, so that, you know, the most people can watch and see, see that the funny thing is, um, and this was planned long before the lottery results were done, San Antonio and Charlotte both signed up to play in the California classic. And then I think the schedule came out after the lottery results, mm-hmm. but they matched up on their first night, uh, San Antonio and Charlotte. So, um, at shocker 8 p.m eastern um so they're, they're definitely i think you know lo- i think the california classic would love you know a wemby scoot henderson wemby mm-hmm. brandon miller you know match up uh there the one thing with one binyama that i will caution folks on is he's still playing his team is still playing in the french league uh right now so he's still yep. going his season is still still happening here as we approach the middle of june so we'll see how much summer league we even get out of him because this is a spot where often when these guys are playing deep into the year like this we don't see some of the overseas guys play um in summer league luka Doncic did not play in summer league um because he, but in part because his season had gone so long uh in Spain before he yeah. came over so so we'll see you know where that goes but you know one way or another I think we're probably going to get him on the floor at some point um yeah and if it happens in Sacramento yeah, that's fine with me I I won't be in Sacramento but uh, I'll be tuned in and watching for sure if it yep. happens just in case everybody was wondering July 3rd is the date of that first uh uh, thing they're playing the third, taking the fourth off, and then playing the fifth. Uh, the Utah, I believe, is the third, fifth, and sixth. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Utah Summer League, and then everybody you know hops over to Vegas for the uh, seventh. And Sacramento and uh, Utah to Las Vegas, those are pretty short trips. Uh, so that's why these teams are willing to jump in and play play the few extra games um, in those summer leagues. Selfishly, I sure hope he plays in Vegas because that's <laughs> that's where you you and I are going to be. But um, and, and it, that'll be one of those ones. If it's like he's going to play, that'll be one. We will be in Thomas and Mac by yep. 10, 11 in the morning local time and post it up and not even move you know, the rest yeah. of the time because because we know what happens in those media seats that will be full to to the brim that was uh that that was how it went with zion williamson uh the game and then then there was an earthquake later that night and that's right paul george and russell westbrook went to the to to uh or i guess paul george went to the clippers with Kawhi leonard and yep. russell westbrook went to the road what a you know crazy day so, that was and i i don't know i'm not gonna predict that because that's uh crazy and let's hope for no more earthquakes but but i i think we're gonna see some wild stuff in, in free agency for sure absolutely absolutely all right everybody well that will wrap things up for us today make sure you do let us know your thoughts in the comment section down below if you're over on the youtube channel if you're listening to the podcast version of this leave us that five star rating and review over on apple podcasts till next time everybody see ya and stay safe